Hey, welcome to the podcast, Mason. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to the audience with the question, who do you say you are? Who do I say I am? Um, my name is uh, Mason West III, um, which carries the identity of my grandfather and my father. Um, I am a father and uh, a husband. Um, I'm also an educator. That's how I would define myself. I like it. And I guess to to go in a little bit of your background of um, being an educator, but first starting back with your grandfather, um, can you tell me a little bit about your family history, kind of with him to how it got to you? Uh, yeah, my uh, grandfather, uh, his name was uh, Mason West. Um, he had uh, nine children. Uh, one of his uh, children, his fourth, was my father, um, uh, Mason West uh, Jr., who was born in uh, Philadelphia. So my family, my father's family was raised in uh, in South Philadelphia. Um, my father, um, at 18, went into the military, went into the Air Force and served in the Air Force uh, for uh, 20 years and retired um, in uh, 1972 in Anchorage, Alaska at Elm uh, um, uh, Elmendorf Air Force Base. Uh, that's where I was born and um, was raised in Anchorage, Alaska until uh, or lived there until I was about 14. And I uh, went to a school, a boarding school in Pennsylvania called Pine Forge Academy. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, went to college in the South at first uh, Oakwood College, which is now Oakwood University. Um, and yeah, that's uh, uh, my background as far uh, as my family uh, is concerned. That's pretty cool. I'm curious to know how you go all the way from being in Alaska. I know you said with your father being a, a military man and having to travel, I, I guess you pretty much grow up as a military kid on the base, but to go from there to South, um, not just the South, but Alabama, and then kind of, as many people know, or many, many people may not know, Oakwood being like a famous school, or at least hearing of it through the prayer line, which is how I met you and just seeing how many other people have gone there, like Ryan Manning, I recently had on and just um, how people that have gone to Oakwood kind of brag on it. Uh, how did you go from Alaska to, to uh, Alabama and Oakwood college? Well, when I lived into Alaska, I went to um, a, a Christian school, which was predominantly white and of course, I had issues there uh, with racism. So my parents wanted to find a school that I could attend in high school that uh, was predominantly Black. My mother was raised Seventh-day Adventist, so she knew of a Seventh-day Adventist uh, boarding school, which was only one of two Black boarding schools um, in the United States, and that was Pine Forge Academy. So mm -hmm. I ended up going to Pine Forge Academy in the 10th grade and graduated from there. Pine Forge Academy is a feeder school for Oakwood College or now Oakwood University, which is a Seventh-day Adventist HBCU. So mm -hmm. when I graduated from Pine Forge, pretty much the only school or college uh, I knew about or that was, you know, uh, I was informed about was Oakwood. And gotcha. Oakwood is in Huntsville, Alabama. So I ended up uh, going uh, to Oakwood. That makes sense. I guess with that, um, like how close are they in relation to each other, Pine Forge and Oakwood? Uh, as far as distance, Pine Forge is in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, which is about 40 minutes from Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Oakwood is in Huntsville, um, Alabama. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's like a 14-hour uh, drive. Man, I guess... I'm just curious for a feeder school, that's that's quite a ways to go, like north to south. Yeah, yeah, it is. But it's the, you know, Oakwood is the only uh, Adventist HBCU. Uh, so, of course, uh, a lot of black students who are in Adventism, you know, from all over the world uh, are attracted to going uh, to Oakwood. Gotcha. And can you tell me a little bit about what um, Adventism is? Because I, I'd never... I wasn't too familiar with it growing up. I think I grew up maybe Protestant or Pentecostal with my dad being a preacher and growing up as a preacher's kid, you kind of, like you're describing, you kind of one track mind as to what you know about the world. And then once you get past high school, maybe into college, you start 
searching things out yourself and you're like, okay, I wonder what this is, or I wonder what that is. Yeah. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church, um, uh, was established, uh, I think around 1850, uh, the church, uh, came, uh, out of, um, a movement, uh, called, uh, the great, Dis great disappointment in 1844, when a lot of Christians thought Jesus Christ was uh, coming back in 1844 based on the, the predictions of uh, and uh, biblical interpretations of a man named um, William Miller. Now, a lot of people thought he was Adventist and the great disappointment was Adventist, but it was not. The Adventist uh, church did not exist at that point. But out of that movement, people begin to uh, gather. They, um, Based on their studies of the Bible, um, mm -hmm. they decided to go to church on uh, Saturdays uh, rather than Sundays um, because Saturday was the seventh day and they wanted to keep the Sabbath, hence the name Seventh Day. And mm -hmm. then primary focus of the church was eschatology, um, focusing on the last days and the fact that they believe uh, Jesus Christ was coming soon. And uh, the second coming was uh, referred to as, you know, the second advent, therefore Seventh-day Adventist. Um, and in the 1850s, the church formally uh, was established and uh, has been in existence um, since that time and is now a worldwide church, I believe, of around 8 million uh, people. That's pretty cool. And hmm. I, so I guess with that, once you, you had a chance to go to um, the feeder school before and then eventually go to an HBCU, like what was that contrast like for you when you went to an all-white school and now you get to go to a predominantly Black school? Well, you know, I went to a uh, an all white school that was a Southern Baptist um, in a conservative state. Uh, mm -hmm. So there was a lot of implicit bias and dare I say racism uh, at the school. Um, so even though I excelled at the school and was usually the top student in my class from kindergarten uh, uh, to ninth grade, you know, just every day of dealing um, uh, with racism. And then also with a, a pretty um, one-dimensional um, view and um, uh, Western European uh, view of Christianity and of God, of course, it takes its toll. Mm -hmm. Going to Pine Forge Academy, of course, you were uh, uh, surrounded by people who looked like you, who celebrated pe people in history that looked like you, uh, people that high, had high expectations of you. And then at Pine Forge Academy, um, you know, you saw a different narrative than what you would hear in music, see on television, or hear from uh, white people. And that was Black excellence. And so um, that had a tremendous effect on me and I wanted to continue that experience. And, uh, that's why I, uh, ended up going to an HBCU. Hmm. That makes sense. I, well, I guess, I don't know if I'd say times have changed, but it's, it's always interesting for me. And, and I guess having this conversation was of interest because I'm curious to meet other people and, get an idea of what life has been like for them because everyone has a, a different view or a different background. Like me, I originally immigrated to the U S back in 97, but kind of growing up um, as a preacher's kid and not necessarily knowing like what different sex were. And at the time I was seven or not. Um, I hope I said the word right, like sect group groups of Christianity and things like that, like not knowing exactly what they were, but also growing up middle class or growing up um, in an area where I could say it's predominantly white. Some biases, maybe I, I saw some biases may have been more explicit. But I think one thing that I've learned is that sometimes for, for some people, it's like um, learning learning not to throw the the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So it's like when, when you're explaining something, it's um, someone may kind of just like shut, shut down where it's like, oh, racism. It's like, oh, here, here we go. But it's like to, to live through something or to like be able to explain and also for someone to be able to receive and listen without judgment. I, I found that as important in trying to understand, um, where your life is and kind of where my life might line up with that to see 
what it is that I can ultimately learn and then how I can move forward. And I think that kind of maybe takes us to the point of maybe how we met or how I, how I came to learn about guys like yourself or men that would get together in order to share their stories and to um, level up, so to speak, or to just have a, a different outcome of not just saying my life is my own and I'm just going to keep suffering through it, but I'm going to find a way to right. meet people where they're at and share my experience. Yeah, I think those types of interactions are important because uh, growing up, um, you know, we all usually grow up in uh, cultural and ideological silos, mm -hmm. you know, because you're just around the people you are around. You learn from who you're around. And as you grow, um, sometimes um, to stay in uh, places and positions of comfort you tend to stay around people who have the same ideology or belief system uh, that you do. And um, what that can result in is, you know, having, having a myopic view in life and also limiting your learning. So, yeah, I think it's good to connect with people um, like we do on the prayer line, you know, where you are able to engage people who see the world through a different lens, which helps expand your lens. Right, right. And I'm curious, um, since going to Oakwood, what how did how did you move forward in life? Did you um did you stay around more people that look like you or were you encouraged to um be around people that were different from you, different thought, different skin tone, different like culture, different everything? No, um, being in the Seventh-day Adventist church, um, I, I tended to stay in places of ideological comfort. I went to Oakwood and I received a bachelor's degree in theology, thinking that I would uh, become a, um, a pastor, but I wasn't hired um, as a pastor. When I uh, graduated from college, my uh, first job was as a teacher in an Adventist school. And so I worked in uh, Adventist schools in um, in Georgia, in Alabama, in Bermuda, um, and then uh, Alabama again over about um, 13 years. Um, and uh, then uh, I, I decided to get, within that time, I decided to get a master's degree in urban and regional planning and community development because I wanted to be able to apply what I had learned in theology to impacting communities. And what I found was that I could not really impact communities in an effective, efficient, and progressive way just through a theological lens. There were other ways um, to help people other than just preaching the gospel. You could help people through uh, creating uh, shifts in the economy. You could help people through creating shifts in government and through the um, social uh, sphere. So I, uh, for a while, uh, worked in this government initiative started by the first President Bush called Weed and Seed, um, where the government would give you money to go into a community and work with law enforcement to get crime out of the community, which was the weeding part. And then um, you would work with social organizations to being positive programs into the community, which was the seeding part. And so I did that for about three or uh, four years. Um, and then with that knowledge, I got back into education, but I found religious education to be limiting uh, because religious dogma of that organization kind of shaped uh, what you uh, what you taught. So I ended up then going to work for a public school in Chattanooga, which was a really struggling uh, public school, which opened my eyes to a lot uh, of issues that were being dealt with on the Black community. And then I went on the opposite side of the spectrum and started working for um, an independent school in Huntsville, uh, Alabama, which, you know, uh, this independent school, most of the young people that attended the school uh, had means. They were um, they were quite wealthy, which showed you the opposite side. And mm -hmm. then uh, based on that, I decided, even though I would uh, still work in education, uh, that I would create uh, programs 
um, that would create opportunities for those who had the ability to do, to do great things, but not necessarily the opportunity. That's when kind of my world um, ideology began to expand and I began to meet and engage people of different ideologies, different backgrounds and experiences, you know, so that I can create some uh, form of equity in the parts of the world uh, that I would impact. So it was a, a little later in life that maybe um, in my uh, mid or late thirties that I really uh, started to expand um, my view and perspective of the world through interaction with people from different parts uh, of the world. Wow. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, as you were speaking and you mentioned the echo chamber, so to speak, or like the um, ideology silos we, we get caught up in. I was curious um if you recognize it at the time or if it took a while for you to sense it, but for you to say that it kind of came in your late thirties, I would, I'm thinking to myself that that kind of makes sense because at like how we experience the world is, is um maybe subjective to us, but ultimately it's at maybe at, at multiple times you have a, a chance to decide whether what you see is all that there is or if you go to seek seek out something different to see if like okay if this isn't working can i create something else or has someone else already done it that i can like emulate them or is there something that i don't know like being able to ask some of those questions i, I think are um that's what i i learned from you listening to you speak sometimes on the line and just like watching you from a distance, whether it's through um, hearing of pupils of yours or, or just the way that you, you communicate, you sound as though you've had to think from different perspectives and acknowledge that you might not know everything, but at least what you do know is informative enough to the person that's receiving it to where th there's, it's, it has some value and some weight to it. Yeah, um, I you know learned um, during that time of, of transition that if you're going to truly um, help people um, in the world, uh, usually you have to expand your perspective. One ideology, one denomination, one religion um, doesn't have all of the answers. It's the um, range of human experience that the more you are aware of what the world is like through different lenses, the better you are equipped to help people through different situations. Mm. That makes sense. I, I'm curious to get your take on, on something I, I came across recently. It's, it was speaking towards um, symbolism in the way that um, today and people before us, I guess they'd say maybe ancient people have seen the world through um, pictures versus just words where the religion of today, where a lot of people may not be, so to speak, religious, but they trust more of things that are scientific, that are philosophical, that are concrete, things that they can write down, touch, see, calculate, measure, things like that. But um, the unexplained or the miracles kind of get lost um, in the wonder. And it's like when you can't explain something, it kind of gets pushed to the side or uh, um, ignored, so to speak. Like, have, I guess my question is, do you, do you see people wrestling with that, trying to see like, okay, do I do away with the religion that I grew up with um, that doesn't make sense to me anymore? Or do I try to find a way to um, find value in the things that kind of help shape me versus just saying to hell with that, I'm just gonna go this route and like find an, a new God or like a new token to um, make my way through the world? Yeah, I, you know, um, I think you are always going to be shedding parts of your ideology because you know when you're when you're talking about god if you're talking about an an omnipotent omniscient you know omnipresent eternal being 
there is no way that um, any individual or group can understand that, you know, which is, you know, um, you know, when the psalmist says, what is man that thou art mindful of him, you know, the son of man that you would visit him, you know, and it just shows the the greatness and expanse of God and the God in our mind will forever be smaller than the God that truly exists. So I think, you know, ideas that are beyond our scientific explanation, we usually attribute, you know, uh, some religious uh, um, meaning to it or some religious structure to it. In every society, you know, the most important uh, uh, people in those societies have always been the priests or the religious figures because they create the story or they create the ideas for things that people did not understand. If they did not understand uh, when, why, and how it rained, the religious figure would come up with the, with the rain dance. If they did not understand what... Uh, death is and what happens after death, the religious people would come up with a story, you know, about what death is. Um, and those things constantly grow as God reveals more of his universe to us. The Greeks, you know, thought that the gods lived on top of Mount Olympus until somebody climbed Mount Olympus. You know, some people thought, you know, the world was flat. It ended, you know, um, at the horizon until someone sailed around the world, you know. So um, usually we define God with what we don't understand. And then when we start to understand, then that God becomes so much bigger. There was a point we thought the earth was the center you know, of the entire universe, you know, yeah. and then, we, you know, found out it's, it's not, it's one, you know, of nine or 10 planets that depending on how you define planets and one solar system. And that solar system is one of 80 billion in, in one galaxy. That's probably part of millions of galaxies in the known universe. So I don't think that, you know, as you grow, you stop believing in God. Mm -hmm. I think as you grow, you realize that God is much bigger than you thought. And there are mm -hmm. some aspects of your religion you may stop believing in. There are some aspects of your religion that you might find out, oh, that was taught in ignorance. People just didn't know. Mm -hmm. But your, I think a mistake is to abandon the reality of God because of the fakeness found in some religion. But I think it's more important that you just realize Man, God is just bigger. And that's what happens as you continue to grow. That makes sense. And I guess in that, it's like, there seems to be a, a piece in it where, for me at least, where I, I don't have to know what the end goal is, so to speak. And it's not always a... Um, like a, a wrestling to find out of, of course there, there's things that I'm curious about and there's things that I may meditate on or just be like, uh, I wonder what that is. And and that's why we have the conversations and en engage with other people to kind of figure out what they know or figure out what we can learn from each other. Um, on that note, I'm curious what, what's something you, you learn from, um, some of the communities you've been able to interact with, whether it was, um, being in Alaska, being in Pennsylvania, being in Tennessee, Georgia, Bermuda, Alabama, like what's, what's something you appreciated about like being in different locations and areas like that and eventually being able to travel the world? What I learned interacting with different people is that, you know, human beings are human beings and that our aspirations are usually the same, usually because of you know, uh, the the belief that there are scarce resources, um, that only um, a few of us will have access to certain resources. You know, mankind invents uh, uh, things to divide himself so he can take advantage of someone else so that he can have access to resources. You know, so we invent things like race, 
We invent things like religion. We invent things like political ideology so that we can look down on someone else and have an excuse uh, to hoard resources from them. But, you know, as I travel uh, the world, um, every religion that I've come in uh, contact with, you know, um, it's it was started, you know, to get rid of barriers. You know, it's just that man's uh, sin uh, reinvents those barriers again because of the belief of scarce resources. You know, everywhere, you know, uh, uh, I've been um people no matter what their uh the color of their skin is no matter uh you know what their political ideology is usually they have the same aspirations and if they get beyond the barriers that are um socially mandated when they get beyond the barriers that are social constructs you find that people can work together and achieve great things and when they achieve those great things they prove that scarcity is a lie you know, mm-hmm. that we all um, um, share equally in this world, maybe differently, but equally. Right. And that, I guess, how would you say you've been able to see, um, say, the limitations of scarcity or s- seeing people move away from the limitations of scarcity? See, if like you're, um, you come to a city or a town where people are just like, okay, um, we don't have enough of this to go around. And if we share this resource, then that that's going to be it. We've got to keep what's ours, ours, but something say something happened and then they gave up what they thought was limited. And that actually multiplied as a result. Yeah. Usually you find that out in crisis. Usually people will divide themselves because of the belief of scarcity. Um, And then something happens, a disaster, a storm, war, uh, these things. Um, And then people realize, or you actually start to run out of something. And usually what happens is uh, unity and human ingenuity kick in. Mm -hmm. And then find a way um, to produce food in a different uh, fashion. Uh, you invent a technology that allows you uh, to use a certain resource in a better way so that it lasts longer. Usually unity and human ingenuity um, happen, and they happen as a result of some type of uh, of crisis uh, uh, that occurs. And then people realize the futility of the barriers uh, they set up, you know, and then they move forward. But then again, greed kicks in, selfishness kicks in, Uh, people want to hoard things for better cars or better uh, money uh, for a feeling of of success, you know, but then what happens is crisis happens again, you know, and man finds a way through unity and human ingenuity to overcome what they thought was a scarce resource, but really, but really isn't. That's interesting. It's funny. Um, it's almost like you have to place it's like you have to remove limitations on the way that you think but at the same time it's just like you have to put limitations on yourself to maybe behave differently in the world but it's there's no guarantee in what the outcome is and it's like a game you have to like just keep on playing and see what the outcomes are it's like something good something bad but you you keep moving forward to get a better outcome Yeah, I just think the failure of mankind has been not to change the way we educate ourselves. You know, we still have a framework for civics or a framework for economy, you know, a framework, you know, um, for uh, approach to social ideologies that constantly is, is proven wrong. But we tend to educate ourselves Um, in that way, you know, um, the whole idea of scarce resources, you know, you know, you go back to Adam Smith or Austrian economics or Keynesian economics and, uh, uh, or Malthusian, um, um, economics, and you're taught this idea, idea of scarce resources, you Mm -hmm. know, but there's been research done that has proven it wrong, you know, 
uh, that mankind can survive with a larger population. Mankind can survive. Everybody can eat. Everybody can uh, have shelter. But we only seem to figure that out in a result of a crisis when we have to. But we haven't changed the way we educate ourselves about humanity. We haven't changed the way we educate ourselves about God. And so that's why we keep going through this cycle. Once we change the way I feel we educate ourselves mm -hmm. uh, about uh, the world um, and our place in the world and in the cosmos, then I think that game stops. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit about um, Nation Builders and how you came to find it or be involved in it and just how you've used um, what we've been talking about to implement implement that? Yeah, Nation Builders is a nonprofit uh, organization. The uh, purpose of the organization is to prepare emerging leaders in high school and college to influence their peers in government and economy as agents of change. Um, the program started uh, years ago under a different name called uh, Talented 10th. When I was uh, working on a program in Huntsville, Alabama, the weed and seed program I discussed earlier, mm -hmm. um, I had some, the, the community that I worked in was called Terry Heights. Uh, I was over a community of about 10,000 people. We were able to get crime out of the neighborhood working with the police sheriff's department um, and the, um, uh, the FBI uh, pretty easily. Um, and then we brought in uh, positive um, um, programs. One of the programs I created was a mathematics and debate program for fifth graders. And I had convinced a college that if these fifth graders got through the program in their fifth grade year to give them uh, uh, full scholarships, which the college did. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the program, what I uh, discovered out of all of the uh, prizes that the kids won when they went home, what they left behind were the certificates that said that they could go to college free. And what I discovered upon further research is many of them did not believe that they would survive uh, to college. Even some of their parents um, um, didn't or did not think that they would fit in college. And the reason why is most of the kids had never really been out of their neighborhood. Most of the parents had really never been too far uh, from the neighborhood. So I decided to create a program that would cause them to interact um, with individuals and organizations and institutions outside of their neighborhood. And the program at the time was called Talented Tenth. And the mm -hmm. goal of the program was to train young people to look at their community, see problems in their community, apply what they learned in the classroom to, to develop solutions, and then present their solutions at every level of government all the way up to um, Washington, D.C. And so I did that program um, from 2000, um, what was it, 2002 uh, to 2015 under the name of Talented Tenth. Um, and then I changed the name um, to Nation Builders. The reason why I changed the name to Nation Builders is fashioned after Genesis 12.1, uh, uh, where uh, God told uh, Abraham he wanted him to build a nation, you mm -hmm. know. But and a lot of people confuse that with God wanted Abraham to build a religion, which is not what God wanted Abraham to do. He wanted him to build a nation. And a nation has different facets involved. And I wanted um, to train young people uh, to build a nation. So I called uh, the, the program Nation Builders. And so basically what we do is we challenge young people at the local level uh, to identify uh, problems in their community and come up with solutions for those problems and use technology uh, to facilitate uh, solving uh, those problems. And after a while, we were able to develop uh, relationships with uh, women of AT&T, um, Technology Association, and now Microsoft um, uh, to facilitate these kids uh, being involved with this. Then we took the program to an international level where we bring kids from different countries together to solve problems based on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. uh, so in countries like Egypt, um, uh, Belgium, Mexico, um, England, I've uh, worked with uh, young people and also uh, Bermuda at one time in Jamaica, worked with um, young people where they make teams with American students, they identify a sustainable development goal, they identify a problem and they come up with a technology um, mm -hmm. to solve that problem. And then they compete. Um, 
just um, just this past summer, uh, Microsoft and Technology Association of Georgia Women of AT and T. Uh, we've added another element of it called Innovation Nation, where we have a group of young people who are coders, um, who are good in technology, mm -hmm. and once a team wins a competition because they've developed an app idea, then we combine them with people in Innovation Nation who actually will build their app and take it to market. And so that's, uh, we've, uh, are piloting that program right now, but that's pretty much how Nation Builders um, uh, works. That's pretty cool. I, I guess I'm curious to know, um, when you made that shift with the original group of fifth graders that you work with, um, or did they take to it? Like, actually looking at their community and seeing that, okay, hey, I can identify a problem. I can communicate the problem with adults or other people in my communicate in my community and actually have a a tangible effect that I can see that's not like short term, but like I can walk by an area, whether it's a neighborhood, it's a building that's been broken down, or it's like um people that aren't being tended to, like did the initial response that the parents gave and that the students had of leaving the certificate behind that, hey, you get through this in fifth grade, we'll get you through college. Like, were you able to um, communicate with those same students once you applied the changes to eventually lead to nation builders? Not that group. It took a while. It mm -hmm. took a while because there's a mindset that comes with living in marginalized communities, um, living in poverty. Um, that program, um, when I started Talent Attempt, did not begin with that uh, fifth grade group. Mm -hmm. It began when I, um, um, first when I went to uh, Bermuda, and then second when I went to Birmingham, it started with high school uh, uh, students. And so... Um, that uh, iteration of the program, we had a group of middle school and high school students who came up with a plan for a community in Birmingham, and they went and they presented the plan to the city council. Mm -hmm. And the city council hired them for $30,000 uh, to implement the plan. So that group presented to city council, then presented it to the state legislature, then went to Washington, D.C. and presented it there. But that plan did not get developed because of, you know, uh, that was a religious school. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the religious people who were focused on Jesus is coming soon felt it was a waste of time. Mm -hmm. um, um, so they got as far as getting paid to do it. But then mm -hmm. out of that group for about three years, I had a couple of kids who were hired by the Justice Department to go around and do trainings in youth leadership. Yeah. Um, then the next iteration at a at another school, we did the same thing. And then that turned into a, a school-wide plan. So, um, and each time that we've done it, we've gotten all the way to the kids creating a plan for the community, mm -hmm. right? But the but the challenge was always not the government, not investors. It was always the community because mm -hmm. the people in the community could not believe that their community could be transformed because of the poverty uh, mindset. Right. right. It's just been recently in the na na uh, last couple of years that uh, through engaging the community, people have started believing that change can happen. Mm. Right. And so people oftentimes, you know, think that the problem is external to, to the community. And mm -hmm. a lot of times communities are created purposely to marginalize people. But once those, once those people get in a cycle of marginalization, sometimes the problem ceases to be external and it becomes internal because right. people believe that they can't change. But just recently, you know, we're, we're getting to that point where, wow, people believe um, we can change our community. So like with this last program, with these kids developing their app, mm -hmm. this is now young people starting to believe, wow, I can develop an app and I can do uh, something with it. Yeah, that that's amazing. And, and when you describe the program, especially the part about um, getting getting kids for that matter, because it's like, the younger you are, maybe the more malleable your brain is and you don't get um, 
condition as quickly, or you have opportunity to to have different things to pull from. But um, speaking with um, Eddie Butler and seeing what he does with his program with Mayhem, trying to get minorities abroad, again, kind of trying to get them out of their their environment and to see like, okay, hey, there's another world out there. If you grew up like in the hood or in the projects, like everywhere in the world isn't like that. And um, speaking with uh, Dr. Jimmy Shaw and seeing he's um, based out of Florence, Alabama, and for them, they had gone to Texas, try to look into a program where they were graduating kids with technical degrees, where it's like, here are options you can go to college to do, because it's like, um, I guess there there's somewhat of a debate of like, okay, what are you going to go there to do? And it's like, is your degree, so to speak, eventually going to pay off or are you going to be living to pay off a debt indefinitely? And then if you can't pay it off, will your family be stuck with that? But being able to see these different examples from different men, all from the line, but also in different um, parts of the country or different parts of the globe, it's it's um, it's encouraging to know that each person is making an effort and um maybe i'd ask you this do you see that the efforts that we make as individuals in our own communities does that work towards the greater good of changing the way we think or changing um how our communities function versus trying to make it like a national push or a global initiative to be like everybody has to be abroad to like do this one thing like is one better than the other or is one more effective than another having everybody on one page versus like this is what we're going to do in this town and if we can get five ten people to agree and walk something out then maybe somebody else will see it and they'll be able to replicate it I think both are true. I think people, you're seeing um, small victories in different areas. But as I said before, the whole education model has to change. Mm-hmm. So, you know, with our work with uh, Microsoft, you know, what they are interested in is can people learn our technology so that they can contribute, you know, uh, to the economy through with our products? And they don't really care about if you have a college degree, right? Right. You get certified in our systems. The same thing with Google, you Mm -hmm. know, the same thing with, um, with other organizations with windows or whatever. Um, Can you get certified in our stuff? And if you can get certified in our stuff and produce with our stuff, right. Then you can give to the community, right. Mm -hmm. Right now, the major push in education, you know, is the liberal arts where you get a degree, um, um, in something, you mm-hmm. know, but still, usually you have to transfer that knowledge to something else. Mm-hmm. Our goal right now is starting with high school and soon uh, middle school is how can we get uh, young people to master um, these systems? Now, at first it was technology as far as coding and engineering, but now it's AI, you mm-hmm. know, uh, can you um, master AI now? So that you can, you know, contribute uh, uh, to the economy. So I, I, I think that, and then also, can you do it in a way that you're just not memorizing, but you're innovating, that mm-hmm. your idea, that you're coming up with ideas and you're solving problems? Because right. pretty soon, the focus on teaching specific content it won't be needed. In fact, it's not needed now. You right. could probably create a teacher, you know, in AI that can. Uh, give you all the content you know you can already go on Khan academy and get all of the content you need you know Mm -hmm. as far as high school is concerned now we have to create classrooms and academic experiences uh where uh, students are mastering tools Mm -hmm. right so they can create stuff that solve problems in the world the idea of you know, learning long division and the quadratic equation. And can you memorize the presidents and the capitals here or learn the uh, three parts of government? These are all things that you can Google and find the answers in seconds, Mm -hmm. you know, 
There are mechanisms now, like you can take pictures of a math problem and um, AI or Google or whatever will solve it for you. So we have to transition from just the memorization of processes and then, and rather use innovation uh, to use those processes to solve problems. And that needs a change in um, how we educate. As right. far as collaboration, you know, across the country or across the world, I am a proponent of people coming together mm -hmm. and creating, you know, a um, countrywide uh, system, which is, you know, I advocate for on the prayer line, you know, a lot, you know, we come to conferences like the, uh, what would, what did we call it? The th uh, 360 man mm -hmm. uh, conference or, or we'll come to summits and we will get motivated, mm -hmm. right, to go back in our silos. Right. And I think I love motivation, but I think we should come together and we should plan. And then we should implement that plan in our areas from a central place. Uh, I think that's where I don't want to say failing, but I think that's where we are missing uh, the mark. Yeah. Uh, as far as impacting the world. I think we're a little um, stuck on the motivation and we're not building systems because the yeah. only way you could take down a system is with another system. Right. And I think to your point, when you speak on the education system needs to change, um, two things that kind of jump out to me is when we operate from a, a fear standpoint where it's like, you're not sure, you don't trust, what the change will be and then also if you're not encouraged to ask questions to v develop your thinking and to be like okay if i don't memorize this like how can i go about getting the information that i need or how can i um question my approach to help me develop a better approach and i think it's things that are are simple but sometimes they they challenge where we're currently at or what we've grown comfortable with to where it's like, okay, you changing where you're at now, it might feel uncomfortable and it might feel uneasy, but it helps you like going from A to B, it may not always be like this, um, this relaxed thing that you do. But I, I think being, being encouraged and knowing that there's growth in the process of like doing things that are fearful or at least addressing like why we don't want to do something or um, what do we think would be the negative outcome of it and what could we do in, in place of it? Like being able to answer some of the questions that we have, I think may be worthwhile moving um, past where we are instead of just being stuck on conditioning, stuck in fear, or um, ultimately hampered by paralysis, so to speak, because you don't, you don't trust in what's, what's going to be next, or what's kind of looking at you, or, or what's, what's going to be facing you. It's, it's like an invitation to adventure. But if you're not, if you're not willing to go on the adventure, you, you kind of you exist like you 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 go through the day to day but to your point i think there's a beauty in being able to plan something execute it and being proud of the execution but also leaving room for um new ideas whether they don't come from you but they come from someone else but you can work on it together and be like okay this is difficult like here's how i need to do it but now somebody finds the way that you did that, here's how you can do it three times better using a different process. You don't have to um, do long division. Here's a calculator. Here's here's something else. Like it's not, life doesn't always have to be a like just a constant struggle. And everyone, like you said, is in their individual silos and it's just like, life is hard. And, and then you come together and it's like, man, life is hard. And you go through a circle, just like life is hard. And it's like, what are we going to do about it? 
Yeah, I think our major challenge is, is that we change, but we change in the way that, you know, people who control the resources want us to uh, to change. And usually the way in which we change just furthers, you know, the marginalization. So there are things that we don't memorize anymore. Like we don't memorize phone numbers anymore, hmm. right? We don't um, memorize directions uh, anymore, or we don't use maps anymore. You hmm. know, we all plug in GPS. We've got people's phone numbers in our phones. So things that used to occupy our brains don't occupy, you know, our brains anymore. You know, so we'll use technology, but we'll use technology the way that those who usually control the economic or control the market mm -hmm. want us to change. And what I'm saying with all of these tools out there, right? Like um, we've got, uh, we become more advanced in education. We have more tools in the classroom. We just still use them in the way that perpetuates marginalization. Right. And so what I'm saying, and, and, you know, and I agree with you on this, you know, you know, we don't fear change if someone is telling us to do it, if the market, if mm -hmm. Apple, if Microsoft, if all these people are, are telling us change this way, but we could still use the same tools they give us, mm -hmm. right, to create uh, equity and to uh, create freedom, you know, in other ways. And so I think the the best way to do that. You, you know, is when we come together with different perspectives, different knowledge base, you know, um, different backgrounds and experiences, and we determine where we want to be as a, a people and mm -hmm. use the tools that are right in front of us um, to do it. Like even right now, you know, people are using AI in the way that, you know, the market is telling them to use it. And right. there are probably all kinds of ways artificial intelligence can be used uh, to better our our lives. You, I guess I hope I'm not repeating or restating oh, this okay. question. Do you, do you think people give themselves enough time to ask better questions of themselves or better questions of like, what do I do next? Or what do I, I do now? Know. I don't know. I think we are programmed to give the right answer, but not ask the right question, you know, right. Um, you know, in school, at our jobs, you know, that's what I think we're programmed uh, to do. And I think another shift in ideology, another shift in education is what questions should I be asking, you know, uh, about myself, um, and about um, um, the world, you know, right now our questions are framed by, you know, if everybody, uh, we ask the question, how can I grind more? Why? Because mm -hmm. it's constantly nailed into our heads to grind. Right. We ask ourselves, how can I be more successful with the car or the house or flying first class, you know, and we ask that type of question. Why? Because it's nailed in our head what success is. So even our questions sometimes, or no, I think many times are framed by uh, people who are trying to get us to buy the next thing or believe the next thing. And right. I think our questions have to elevate beyond the control of other people. Mm -hmm. I guess something that's been a, a challenge for me or something I've been trying to work on is um, spending time with myself and asking myself, what do I value about me? And um, what are some things that I appreciate? Not necessarily to um, present them to someone else, but to learn to appreciate being in the presence of myself and um knowing that when i'm around other people i i belong in the in the room so to speak but i i also can be confident that i'm as valuable as the person next to me and i can have a conversation i can have a dialogue but in whether i learn something or i don't learn something it's like the not like in a not in, in a selfish way but kind of going back to the start where we were like growing up in the background of um being a christian and wanting to serve people there's a notion that i kind of grew up with where 
it's part of your value is in um what you do for other people like if you do if you do work and you have faith that's that's a measure of your um how would you state that like what you do for other people is a measure of like the person that you are it's how people can say okay this is a a man of value because he's a man of the people like he cares about people he looks out he um he's maybe someone that's educated he's someone that's learned someone that can be counted on and things like that but whether it's the grind the hustle the things that you you do 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 to be seen or you do 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 to have to give to other people it's like being able to recognize that there's a person that exists in all the doing and that um in all you're doing you can rest in the fact that you matter so to speak that um out of the universe or in god's creation that you're seen as good before you get to doing what it is that you want to do and in, in knowing that you're good you can trust the um when all hell breaks loose that you have an ability to um find your way through it but also when nothing's going on you can also um appreciate that rest so that when you appreciate the person that you are you appreciate the calm you appreciate the the goings ons of the world it's like now when you kind of step out to do something you step out to do something with a purpose because it's like okay i have value the things that i do add value and then in what i'm looking for um it's 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 bigger than myself so to speak at least that that's been my challenge recently in seeing the value within and then also looking at other people not necessarily to get something but knowing that um if i can trust myself i can have some trust in others while still um keeping a keen eye for what may not be right or what can be right and then the things that don't make sense i start to ask questions of like okay well what would you do different in this case or what's not lining up why is it not lining up and maybe i don't get a resolution in that setting but at least it it piques my curiosity to say go look for something different than what you're you're used to don't just go with the um cookie cutter answer or the same old same old rinse and repeat day in and day out it's like actually experience the day and don't just rinse and repeat reflect on what you did but also like make room for what's to come yeah um you know that's kind of everybody's uh uh a journey you know um value is so you know subjective you know um different people uh determine different types of value based on how they were educated based on how they see the world i try to start with the fact that you know i matter because i am matter mm -hmm. you know um like i said uh, a few days ago on the prayer line it's an absolute miracle that I exist. You know, there are trillions of human beings, potential human beings who never and never will have an opportunity, you know, uh, to exist. And just the fact that that one out of, I don't know, millions of uh, sperm cells fertilized that one egg and those, uh, that combination of chromosomes and genes made me, you know, just the fact that I'm here, you know, um, and that's just in the midst of chaos theory. If you come out of chaos theory into um, a, a, a Christian perspective that not all, that you aren't here by chance, you know, mm -hmm. that he that God knew me before he formed me in the womb, you know, that he sanctified and ordained me and gave me a path. Now, I might not understand that path and I might not understand that purpose, but the joy in life is figuring it out, you know. And as I grow, different people will come to me with different definitions of value, different definitions of success, different definitions of good, you know, 
and the joy of life, you know, is figuring it out. And, it, and there's some dynamics to it. There will be ups and there will be downs. But the idea is not that you come to an ultimate destination. You know, the idea is that you enjoy the journey of figuring it out. And that's, to me, the joy of life. I like that. Um, let people know where they can find you, learn about Nation Builders, and just be able to continue to follow your journey. Oh, yeah. Um, my website is nationbuilderslead.com. Uh, on Instagram, I'm Mason West three or nation builders, Inc. And, um, yeah. Awesome. And, uh, one last question for you, kind of going back to how we started the podcast. Are you still who you said you were? Yeah, I believe I am, uh, who I am. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care. Yes.